psychiatry, medication, and the influence of the family movement. And I'm here to ask that we get beyond that. This movement is responsible for the development, this movement, a promotion of a number of extraordinary innovations. All these peer-run support models that are groundbreaking, changing the face of services, and wellness recovery action plans, and the eight dimensions of wellness, and whole health action management, and open dialogue in ECPR. Outstanding, groundbreaking innovations that, as Lynn has said, only reach a few people in the creative pockets that exist. And all the time we are making this progress, tens of thousands of people right now are homeless, are in jail and prison, are victims of violence, are completing suicide, and we are perceived as not really addressing that. We are perceived as being in a bubble, talking to ourselves, raising the lives of a handful of people while Rome is burning. And that's what it looks like from the outside. I've learned over the years to be an advocate, for me, means being a politician and a businessman. A businessman for peer support and a politician to get to the table. And I'm telling you, from the outside, when you get on the, on the front lines of that, we have to really uh, translate what we're doing and show that it extends to the greater group that's out there. Because right now, we're seen in a, as in a bubble. And this bubble will burst if we're not careful. We're seen as a group that wants to debate whether there's such thing as what? Mental illnesses, psychiatric disability, whatever. We often seem like we walk on eggs around whatever it is. We talk about lived experience. That's really important in this room. It means nothing outside. You cannot use that language when you're talking to the chair of a committee or you're talking to a newspaper. And what our enemies say is, you see, they won't even acknowledge that people have symptoms that are suffering. Mm. Whatever the cause, biological, trauma, what have you, we're seen as somehow walking on eggs. That our language doesn't communicate, works for us. We debate what are the causes. And some see us as discouraging and shaming people who take medication, for example. We're seen as being absent from the healthcare integration movement because we're afraid of the medical model. We decry it. We're worried about being co-opted. We have to co-opt the medical model. But we have to participate because we're dying 25 years earlier. We have no choice but to confront and integrate and transform the medical model. No choice. And some would say we say not enough about employment and housing. I've been working on employment for years. The concerned woman in New York never gets into employment, except a couple of providers who provide it. So that makes us very vulnerable to being in the bubble. And there's not enough indication that we're really reaching all these folks. And too often it seems that many of us have a knee-jerk ideological reaction. Just as the other side do, we often see everything as, as attributable to the families, NAMI. To the drug companies, the psychiatrists. Have you heard that? Have you said that? It's bigger than that. It's more complex than that. Wow. It seems like our movement sometimes speaks for a small group, but unless you're on the script, you're not in the tent. Over the past 30 plus years, many of you have been brave, relentless warriors, I got it, for recovery. But now I'm, say, I'm here to say it's time to make peace to win the war. Time to make peace with families, many of whom suffer with the poor, untimely, and all too awful help that we have long decried. That we, sh we share their outrage, we should be able to extend to that. We can well understand and identify the trauma they feel when the system tells them, grieve over your child and let go. We have to appreciate what they feel when their beautiful children disappear and are homeless on the street, screaming with tattoos, as, as one woman told me, saying, I am crazy, living in a jail. We have to understand the family movement, not only because it's right, but politically, it's just foolish not to. We're We're, we can be so much more powerful if we align with that. I spoke at NAMI conference, 
Uh, my job is to be at the table. I spoke with a whole bunch of forced treatment people on it. I want to tell you when I spoke, half the room clapped. More than half the room. They are not a, a monolithic movement, and we're foolish to think that they are. Oh, not. Oh, the families. You know? I believe we must help them address their fears and make it clear to them because when they hear us talk about recovery, they think of it as not my children. Because their, their children are on the street and they don't think we're their candidates for what we're talking about, that we're not reaching them. Peace with those who see themselves as recovered or see themselves as, as recovered. I'm recovered, by the way. Peace with those who take medications out of informed choice. As I told you, I take shiatsu every couple of weeks, and spiritual is critical to my wellness, but I take medication too, and I don't want to be feel ashamed about that. Or that. <laughs> There's only one way to do that. Only one. We don't and can't possibly have the answers to every challenge. We have to make peace with all the other, there are other provider sort of sectors that answer the questions that we can't answer. We can't be the answer to every problem out there, but we sometimes try to be, and we don't look well when we do that. We don't. We're not the preeminent service for housing first, for employment first. We need to we can build these alliances. We need to make peace and pressure a research community. I spoke to the Institute of Medicine, and they were there to talk about, oh, 4% of people with mental illnesses are violent. And I said to them, why aren't you researching why we're 11 times more likely the victims of violence, yeah. and why that happens? <laughs> I think our tent needs to grow much bigger and much further and quickly. We need to build strong alliances. Yesterday in that workshop that we talked about, that, that Katera was talking about, we talked about how these other communities, African Americans had their Selma, women had their Seneca Falls, uh, LGBT individuals had Stonewall. We have not had that moment, that moment. We need to create that moment starting today. And we need you to be on the street for that. Every morning. And not just once in a while with an internet rat, rat, rant or an occasional conversation, but every day. Every day. I gotta move quickly, so I wanna say here, there, you know, we need you know, we spoke yesterday of working with all these groups of reaching out to all kinds of other groups to form a, na a nationwide alliance that says yes to dignity, yes to pride, yes to self-determination, yes to social justice and full full citizenship, and says no more to discrimination, defamation, and criminalization and segregation. The personal experience that I did, when I came in the hotel this time, I met a woman who was the consumer affairs rep of a state that, uh, that I was learning about, and she told me that as peer specialists are being introduced in that state, the traditional staff are saying, I don't want them to work alongside me, and we need to have separate bathrooms. Oh, Segregation.